Hello and welcome to our 21st edition and our second anniversary. We can tell you that with your help, our first 20 programmes have had a clear-up rate of roughly one in six, and they're crimes that almost certainly could never have been solved without your involvement. And there were serious crimes too. 34 have come to trial so far, and all of them have resulted in convictions. One man has just begun a life sentence for murder. Six men are awaiting trial charged with murder, and one for attempted murder. There's been one man convicted of rape and three others charged with rape and 23 men have been charged in connection with armed robberies. Let's quickly bring you up to date about last month's programme. Calls to detectives here in the studio and around the country led to more arrests, more are likely, and there's been a breakthrough in two murder investigations. Marcia Tamboza, a Dutch girl who lived in Surrey, was abducted on her bicycle and she was strangled. 156 viewers called us and one was a criminal pathologist who had a hunch and detectives were intrigued by it and re-examined some forensic evidence. The result has been decisive. Police now know that March's killer also killed Alison Day in East London late last year and is the same man who raped three other women. Detective Chief Superintendent Vincent McFadden says he's quietly confident the man will now be caught. Results in three out of four of our photocall cases, the best response we've had yet to photocall. Two men have been charged with an armed robbery at Holloway in London and with attacks at six other building societies, and a third man has now been arrested too. Two men have been charged with a theft from a jeweller's in Huntingdon. That, surprisingly, was information from a viewer miles away in Glasgow. And a viewer recognised her former boyfriend. He has now been charged with two armed robberies in the northwest of England. This man, however, Dennis Martin, our fourth case last month, has still not been traced. Call us if you've seen him. On the other reconstructions last month, Jason Swift was the 14-year-old runaway found dead in Essex eight months ago. We had 180 calls, including one definite sighting of Jason at Victoria Coach Station. And one viewer has some crucial information. Mike, please, from Croydon, who rang twice to help, please do call again right now. The number direct to the studio is 01811 8055. Ask for Mark, a BBC researcher. We guarantee it's in complete confidence. You may hold the key to prevent another killing. Now to the first of this month's reconstructions. Anne Locke, a secretary at London Weekend Television, had been married just a month when she vanished on her way home one Sunday night. It's a case that's produced big headlines and wild rumours. Tonight, we'll be showing the face of a man that police need to trace in connection with her disappearance. Our reconstruction starts seven weeks ago at Anne's home in Hertfordshire. Hello? Yeah, yes it is. Oh, hello Simon. Just after lunch on Sunday afternoon, May the 18th, Anne Locke's boss phoned from London Weekend Television. I've been about, uh, about four o'clock. Anne occasionally worked Sundays, but the producer asked if she could work a little later than usual. No, I don't mind. Of course I don't mind. That's fine. All right then. See you later. Bye. Anne's 86-year-old grandmother lives in the same house, and she remembers all was normal when Anne left home. Anne's husband was in Dorset for the weekend, planning a diving trip for their sub-aqua club. He was away till late that night. This particular Sunday, we had just sold her car, and she would normally on a Sunday have driven all the way up to LWT where she could have parked her car. But on this particular occasion, because she had no car and the new one had not yet arrived, she cycled to Brookman's Park Station. Brookman's Park is a prosperous Hertfordshire village just north of Potter's Bar. Anne was known around the village by her maiden name, Sunyuk. That Sunday, Anne was only just back from her honeymoon and she had a noticeable suntan for mid-May. Excuse me, what time's the next train, please? To 43. 43? Yep. The ticket okay. collector clearly remembers Anne arriving with her bike. Almost certainly, she would have parked it in the station bike sheds and locked it. Mm -hmm. 
Anne's normal route to work took her on the Welling Garden City to London Line that used to be called the GN Electric. It stops at places like Potter's Bar and Finsbury Park. London Weekend Television on the South Bank. Anne finished typing the London programme scripts at around 8.30. On her way out, she had to hand copies of the scripts to drivers who delivered them to the producers' homes. Hello. Hello. Good evening. Uh, Ellen, you come to collect these? Yeah, I'm going to town. OK. That's yours there. Thank you. Thank right. you. Thank you. Driver, if no one is in, please put through letterbox. You must be joking. What do you think we're going to do, drink it back? Well, you might do. Some drivers would. <laughs> I'll see you. Thanks. Night-night. These were the last people known to have spoken to Anne. No one seems to have seen her since. Assuming Anne went home, she'd normally have walked to Waterloo Underground, the York Road entrance. There she would have waited on the Bakerloo Line platform and taken a northbound train. There are no sightings so far of Anne on this section of her journey, nor at Oxford Circus, where normally she changed onto the Victoria Line. At Finsbury Park, Anne would have switched to British Rail, probably the 938 to Welling Garden City, which would take her to Brookmans Park. No one has come forward who saw Anne that Sunday evening. But if you were there, something might jog your memory. A fellow passenger was behaving rather oddly. It's 9.38 on Sunday, May the 18th. <laughs> Nine stops down from Finsbury Park is Brookman's Park, Anne's home. The bike shed is unlocked and the station is unmanned. This teenager has come forward and remembers seeing someone about half an hour before that London train arrived. Have you seen anybody with an air gun? No, why? Somebody been shooting at pedestrians with an air gun. No, I haven't. Be a fancy ass top and offers. By this time, Anne's husband, Lawrence, had got back from his boat trip. I arrived home just before 10 o'clock. Um, Nan met me on the drive and she was quite distressed as Anne hadn't come home and she hadn't phoned either. I unhitched the boat, unloaded the car and drove back down to Brookman's Park Station. I got there had a look in the bike shed to see if her bike was there and it wasn't, it had, it had already gone. Um, I was about to leave when I saw a train coming in. Just after 10, the train Anne should have been on arrived at Brookman's Park. This couple, Mr and Mrs Masterman, home from a hiking trip, are sure that they were the only people to get off at Brookman's Park. I phoned work to actually ascertain that she had left and they said that she had and left quite some time earlier. I phoned a couple of friends to see if she was around there. I checked the, with the police to see if she had been involved in a road accident on her bike. I then reported her missing to the police at Hatfield. At dawn, five o'clock on Monday morning, police found Anne's bike 60 yards from the station shed. It was still padlocked. From here, Hertfordshire police have mounted a seven-week search of fields, woods and parkland near the Brookmans Park railway station. It's so far taken over 16,000 man-hours. It's turned up some slight evidence that Anne Locke might have got as far as Brookmans Park that Sunday night. Her diary and address book were found along the footpath that crosses Bluebridge Road. Inspector Paul Dockley, you personally found that address book, but it was 700 yards away from the diary found by one of your colleagues. That is quite correct. Now, how do you account for that? Well, in fact, one of the considerations we're making is that that bag that Tam was carrying, which is a black zip-up bag, which we have here... This is a replica, yeah? This is a replica, could have been found and the items abandoned from that bag by some passer-by after the event. 
Uh, now, obviously, we have made inquiries with the Director of Public Prose Prosecutions with regard to this, and he's agreed that there will be no police prosecution. If any person comes forward saying they found that bag, removed any of the contents or the money that was in it, uh, as long as they're not um, involved with the disappearance of Anne Locke. And of course it could have been somebody quite innocently finding quite a dress book, whatever, tossing it away, thinking it was of no good to that's, anybody. That's you desperately possible. need anybody who found the bag, all the contents, anything like that in that area. Now, that teenager who saw that man acting strangely uh, on the Sunday night at Brookman's Park, that was a, a fairly strange piece of behaviour. Well, not only was there that, but on the previous day, the Saturday, at uh, quarter to twelve in the evening, some people had been to a dinner party in Brookman's Park and returning to the station and there was a bench across the entrance to the platform which made them uh, walk in a rather obscure angle onto the platform. They were approached by a man. He asked what time the last train was, stood around for a few minutes and then he made his way out of the platform and up the stairs and out of view and he hasn't been seen since. So on two consecutive nights, just before she disappeared, around the time she disappeared, there was somebody acting strangely. You've got a description. We've got a, the first video fit of this man. Can you describe him to us? Yes, this man is described as 35 to 40 years. He's 5 foot 6 inches tall, of medium build. He has a receding hairline and collar length brownish hair, dark brown hair. Uh, he was wearing a bomber jacket and dark coloured jeans or trousers. And it is uh, believed that he just spoke with a local accent. Right, now that's an entirely new description. And of course, the man presumably need not have been a local. I mean, Brookman's Park is right on the A1 and the M25. That is correct. So yes. he, he could, frankly, have come from anywhere. He could have done. She's been missing a long time now. I mean, do you think there's any chance that Anne is still alive? We are obviously very concerned for her safety. And we do fear that she may have come by her death. Right. OK, well, uh, if you feel that uh, you can help in any way, please do call us. Detectives are waiting for you. Call right now on 01811 8055. Or you can call the incident room at Wellin Garden City. That's 0707 331 011. Wellin Garden City, 331 011. Well, now for this month's incident desk, where we invite police to appeal to you directly. Here are Superintendent David Hatcher and Police Constable Helen Phelps. Last month, we showed you this composite picture of a rapist. He had a very unusual tattoo on his neck. The calls we received included two positive sightings of the man on Barry Island in Wales and at Stratford-on-Avon. Both sightings were at fairgrounds and Essex Police believe the man could now be anywhere in the country. We must find him. Remember that tattoo and call us if you can help. Now to the northeast of England and the murder of Julie Perigo. Julie was a prostitute. In the middle of May, she was found stabbed to death in her home in Sunderland. Most of Julie's neighbours were unaware of what she did. She lived on the downhill estate at number 55 Kidderminster Road. Her flat door faces away from the street so clients could visit discreetly. Usually, she found those clients through these contact magazines. She either placed ads herself or a friend passed clients on to her. On Friday, May the 16th, at about half past one, Julie mentioned to a friend on the phone that she was due to see someone later. Old Jeff has rung. He's going to pop over to see me. Old Jeff might have been a former client of Julie's, and we've a possible description of him. A man in his mid-sixties, about five foot nine, with a large beer belly. Old Jeff was smartly dressed and well-spoken, and he's never been traced. At 4.30 that day, a neighbour called round, but the blinds were down and there was no answer. And at midnight, a taxi was seen waiting outside Julie's block of flats. One man was in the car and another ran into it from Julie's flat and drove the car away. Julie was found dead a week later. Apart from the two men in the taxi and old Jeff, we need to trace this man. He's about 25 and used the name Michael. He may come from Wall's End and has a slight stammer. Michael was a client of Julie's and we know that she met men from all over the north of England and beyond through the contact magazines. So if you were one of them, or if you have any idea who Julie Perigo was with on the day she died, please ring us in confidence. It's over four months now since 16-year-old Kevin Hicks disappeared from his home in Addiscombe, South London. On Sunday the 2nd of March, 
a bitterly cold night, Kevin set off to a nearby late night shop to buy some chocolate and a box of eggs. He needed them for a cookery lesson next day. He never returned. Kevin was a quiet boy and rarely went out. He'd just spent most of his savings on new stereo equipment and it's highly unlikely that he would have planned to run away. On the night he left home, Kevin was wearing a red, white and black bomber jacket, jeans and red and white high-tech trainers. The case hasn't received much publicity beyond London, so tonight we want viewers from anywhere in the country to think whether you've seen Kevin Hicks. For his family, a call tonight is their best hope. On Saturday the 3rd of May, the body of Sandra Court was found in a ditch near Bournemouth. She'd been strangled. Two weeks later, the detective in charge of the case received this anonymous letter. The writer claimed Sandra's death was a complete and utter accident and that the person concerned was deeply unhappy, hurt and in total shock. It continues, the only reason the person has not come forward is fear that their explanation will not be believed. Handwriting experts believe the writing has been disguised. If you wrote this letter, or if you have any idea who did, it's vital that you contact us. And remember, your call will be treated in strictest confidence. Next to jeweller's shop in Kentish Town, London. The man standing by the pillar has just pulled a sawn-off shotgun out of a Texas home care plastic bag. He threatened the shop assistant and demanded cash and jewellery. The staff thought he was about five foot nine. The close-up gives us a fairly good view of his features. But look closely at his manner. He's a snappy dresser and someone must recognise him from this video. He left the shop after three minutes with £10,000 worth of gold and diamonds in the carrier bag. The alarm was raised immediately and only 18 seconds later, two policemen arrived. Unfortunately, they were just too late and he got away. Ring us now if you know him and we'll catch him before he does it again. And finally, an armed robber with a passion for hats. This man has robbed six building societies in North and West London and got away with more than £15,000. He sometimes wears a flat cap, sometimes a trilby and once a sort of white tennis cap but always some light-coloured snakeskin shoes. On one occasion, he had a bandage on his left hand. If you recognise him, or if you can help with any of tonight's incident desk cases, give us a ring. Here's the number, 01811 8055. And that jeweller in Kentish Town mended this very necklace, so do try and help. Well, now to our second reconstruction tonight. Just over seven weeks ago, a 72-year-old woman was found dead in her home in Salford. At first, it seemed she died of natural causes, but then it became clear that she'd been asphyxiated. How or why is still a mystery. Georgina Davis was known as Jean to her friends and neighbours, and it's with their help that we've been able to build up a picture of her life and the events which led up to her death. Our reconstruction takes place in Higher Broughton in Salford. Jean lived in one of the newer houses in Mildred Street. Her husband died 14 years ago, and since she had no other family, she lived alone. Morning, Jean. Oh, hello, Nona. It's a nice day, isn't it? Yes, it is. If it keeps up, I'm thinking of taking the dogs over to Ainsdale Beach and giving them a bit of a run. Oh, good. Do you think they'll sleep tonight, then? <laughs> Jean was a very house-proud lady, always yeah. keeping the house clean and tidy and spick and span outside and in. She was a very nice person to speak to. Um, she was a totally professional nurse. If you can understand me, she was a lady who had been nursing all her life and that's what she lived for, actually. Jean retired 18 months ago as matron of Broughton House, a home for disabled servicemen, but she still did part-time private nursing. Her social life centred on the Griffin, her local pub. A few of her friends met there regularly on Tuesday evenings. If she wasn't working, she often joined them. Jean had one other regular evening appointment, which is still unexplained. The local butcher opposite the Griffin describes what he saw every week. About 6 to 6.30, usually near to 6.30, Jean always used to come and stand on this corner one night a week. And the black escort, which used to come from the direction of Littleton Road, used to pick her up. If the lights were on red, it picked her up on the Cromwell Roadside. If they were on green, she crossed over and it picked her up 
outside the telephone box. And it's always drove off in the direction of Great Kew Street. Apart from nursing, Jean's other great love was animals. She had two dogs of her own, which she adored, and she took them for walks once or twice every day. On Tuesday, the 20th of May, Jean took the dogs, as usual, to the old Salford racecourse in the afternoon. It was the last day any of Jean's friends or neighbours saw her alive. Their statements provide us with a patchy account of that day. I went to the post office that day, caught the number 13 bus back, and then I crossed over the road and saw Jean with her two dogs. Hiya, Jean. Oh, hello, dear. How are you? I'm fine, thanks. How are your parents getting on? Oh, well, they're all right. She seemed normal within herself, quite happy. I'm exhausted. We both walked together up until I reached our house. And I presume Dean went, then went to her house. I'll tell my mum who's asking about it. Do it, do it. Bye. Well, it'd be about 5.45 to 6 o'clock. Uh, it had been raining and it was a pretty sort of murky evening, really. I was aware of a car passing, didn't realise at the time that it was Jean's Metro. But um, when I looked back, I saw this car had parked on the opposite side of the road and I saw Jean coming across the street. She looked a bit angry, actually, so I thought, well, you know, it's not a kind of time to have a chat to her, really. And then I came into my drive and she sort of disappeared to go into hers. That particular Tuesday night, I'd been on the race course walking the dog. On my way off, I uh, decided I'd call at Jean's and invite her out for a drink. It was near enough nine o'clock time, give or take a bit either way. And when I got into Mildred Street, I walked up to the house, knocked on the door, rang the bell and banged on the window. It generally made a, quite a noise, like, so she'd know it was me. And waited a few minutes and got no answer. So I just presumed that she was at work and Went home and got changed and fed the dog. And I went across to the Griffin in about 10 o'clock town. Evening, Al. You up? Although it was Tuesday, Jean didn't join the others that night. Then at midnight, a neighbour driving down Mildred Street noticed something slightly unusual. There was a light on in Jean's spare bedroom window. The next afternoon, when Jean was late for work, her employer rang her and then drove to her home. When she found the broken window, she called the police. Jean's body had been found upstairs in her bedroom. She died from some kind of pressure to her neck. Hello, Dennis. What's the position up here now? Well, it's pretty tidy up there, but they'll have to work in a minute. Yeah, thank you very much. There were no obvious signs of violence nor any struggle, but gradually more details emerged which suggest Georgina Davis was murdered. Well, Mr. Patterson, what makes you believe now that she was murdered? Well, although initially there were very few signs of uh, disturbance in the house, we now know that certain property, including a set of house keys with a Yale and a Mortis uh, key on them, to, uh, are missing, together with a handbag like this, which uh, Mrs. Davis owned, and a, a blue cagoule with a white uh, stripe down the side. And she'd been seen wearing that that very day, hadn't Th she? So that is suspicious. Was, yes, this is what she was wearing that day. Mm. I am particularly interested in finding this, this item of uh, clothing. Uh, also missing from the house is a pair of green Wellington boots uh, similar to these. So if anybody's seen any of those items of clothing or some keys, 
pleased to let you know. Yes, that would be of extreme importance to me. Now, Jean wasn't a great socialiser, was, was she? She was quite a private person, didn't talk about her private life, which has given you quite a lot of problems. What do you most need to know about her life? Well, one thing has come to light. Uh, she is known to have met someone once a week uh, who owns a black A-registered Ford Escort vehicle. This is the, the car the butcher saw? This is the car that pulled up the traffic lights near the butcher's uh, shop, yes. The butcher isn't sure exactly which night of the week it was? No, it could be either Tuesday, Thursday or Friday, uh, our information at the moment. Uh, we have no idea who owns this vehicle at all, and it, it is important that uh, we find that person. And you don't think it was a patient she was going to see? It's unlikely, because normally she was very well dressed when she went out in that particular evening. Right. Now, for a few weeks before she died, she hadn't been making those regular visits on Tuesdays to the Griffin pub, had she? Where do you think she might have been instead? Well, it's possible that the black escort could be connected with this, or we have also heard that she had other jobs that we haven't found out about yet. Anyone who has employed Mrs Davis over recent months, I would uh, very much like to talk to. Right, so you need any patients of Jean's in the recent weeks, uh, the driver of that escort, black escort we saw, and anyone else in particular that you'd like to trace? Yes. Uh, outside the house at 7 a.m. on the Wednesday morning were two men wearing blue boiler suits. These uh, men had a van parked nearby and they were seen to be looking at the house. We have never traced those men. And finally, what's vital is you need to know somebody who perhaps saw her between 4.15 and 6 o'clock on that Tuesday, the 20th of May. Yes, at 4.15 p.m. she came back from walking her dogs. She was then seen coming back in her car at 6 p.m. I do not know where she was in between, and I would like to find out. Perhaps somebody can solve the mystery. Thank you very much indeed. This is the number to ring, 01 811 8055, 01 811 8055. If you can't get through here or you'd rather phone locally, police are waiting for your call at the Crescent Police Station in Salford. That's 061 855 5151. 061 855 5151. Now to our Aladdin's Cave, property that might be yours. In our first two years, Crime Watch viewers have reclaimed hundreds of treasured family heirlooms and over a quarter of a million pounds worth. Here's John Bly. Thank you, Nick. Well, as it's our second anniversary, we have two collections tonight. The first is of clocks. Here's the earliest one, which is rather a good late Regency mahogany case bracket clock. I love this sort of swept pagoda top. And look at this fine quality foliate carving. I really rather like that. Typical 1830s. From about 1880, much later in the century, we've got a, a marquetry one here, engraved and etched in the classical manner. And another type of marquetry is here. In this case, using marquetry of boule, which is brass and tortoiseshell, to give this wonderful, colourful effect but in the 1880s manner. Here in the revival period, that's a pretty little chap. Same period, but a different style. I suppose if you really want the best one of the revivals, then it's got to be the one at the end, a marvellous looking clock. Leaving a fair old gap on somebody's mantelpiece would be the garniture at the end, which, well, nearly right. But this is actually quite an important set and would have had a pair of candelabra to match. The panels of copper are silver, gilt, on a bronze type background. Now, another unusual set is this here, which has the metal encasing porcelain panels, again from the turn of the century. Over here, we've got a very good skeleton clock. And that leads us on to our second collection for tonight, which is stamps. Now, curiously, this is a stamp collection without a theme. From the range from the Vatican first covers to penny reds, to most interesting of all, some Polish prisoner of war camp stamps, which were used in 1944 and 1945. Now, we believe these belong to one person who may have worked for the Mobile Shipping Company. Some of the first day covers were sent to their offices in Pegasus House, and there are copies of the in-house magazine filled with stamps. Now, some of these, some of this collection is extremely rare. For example, that block, if it's genuine, is worth over £3,000. So, while you're busy trying to think of anyone who might help with that, I'm going back to wind up the clocks. Well, the number, once again, if there's anything you recognise, is 01 811 8055. 01 811 8055. Our final reconstruction involves a crime that's callous and reckless in the extreme. It's an unsubtle armed robbery in which two people were shot at in cold blood. It happened five weeks ago in a busy shopping street in Birmingham.
It's 6.30 a.m. on Monday, June the 2nd. The National Westminster in Moseley was expecting some computers to be delivered to the bank and had asked the police to clear a parking space. This man, David Bishop, a bank clerk, arrived at 10 to 9. Later, he'd recall he'd seen a blue Ford Escort parked outside the bank. The bank opened and it was business as usual in Alcester Road for the rest of the morning. Then, at a quarter past one, four miles away, a security express van left its depot in Handsworth. Their first job that afternoon was a routine pickup from the Moseley National Westminster. About the same time, a blue Ford Escort was again outside the bank, with no one in it, despite the parking cones. It's 20 minutes later, 25 to 2. It seems someone was now sitting in the blue Ford Escort. The collection routine took five or ten minutes. The bag contained thirteen thousand pounds. From this point, passers-by gave chase. That's it, that's the car. Okay, we'll follow it. A local businessman had also seen the shooting. The robbers swerved into Oxford Road, almost colliding with another car. Half a mile down Oxford Road, and the escort was getting away. The robbers then turned into Grove Avenue. As the couple in the metro approached the junction, they saw the escort had come to a stop. Don't get too close. Remember, he's got a gun. Okay. But maybe the gunman had got out. At this point, the BMW took over the pursuit, but the escort was getting out of sight. In fact, at Cotton Lane, the escort turned into an empty lock-up garage. With the driver hiding, the pursuing cars drove straight past. A woman opposite was suspicious of the man's furtive behaviour. Hey, what are you doing? It's private property. It's private property, this is. Hey! Stop that man! Can you stop that man? Stop him! No one helped and the driver made off in the direction of School Road. McWilliams, no one helped there, but by heavens, you've got some very courageous people in Birmingham chasing after them like that. What happened to the security guards? One of them had a miraculous escape. The bullet passed through the seam of his trousers, but the other man was seriously injured. The bullet entered his left leg, and unfortunately, he's still walking about on crutches. In fact, I had three shots being fired there. Yes, the third shot, we think, hit a vehicle coming into town, in towards Birmingham, just by the driver's mirror, and again, the driver had a miraculous escape. I know it's not a, a very legalistic phrase, but I mean, frankly, this guy must behaving like a nutter, isn't he? Yes, he is, really. 
Uh, have we got any description of him? We must have from the people who were chasing him. Yes, these have been made up um, from witnesses who saw them. These are artists' impressions? They are indeed, yes. This, this man is about 5, 10, 6 foot, aged uh, 35 to 45. What is very noticeable about him is that he's got a hairy chest and a heavy gold chain around his neck, which is shown on the picture there. Right, that's the gunman. What about the driver? The driver is a younger man, uh, aged 25, 26, only about 5 foot 6 to 5 foot 7, slim, with a very pale complexion. Right, you've brought some things with you that yes. were found in the, uh, in the escort That's as right. a son on that uh, day, Monday, June the 2nd. Uh, if you look at the back, you can see uh, that it's uh, talking about the Brazil-Spain match That's the right. Sunday previously. There's this jumper somebody left in. Yes. Which, uh, not particularly spectacular. And uh, two screwdrivers that were left in the back, and they are on exhibit bags here. Two Where was the car stolen from? The car was stolen from Pet Street in London, South East 18, uh, 36 hours before the robbery was committed. From London? So that's right. the robbers may not come from Birmingham at all, could come no, from that's, anywhere. That's right. People might have seen this chase through Birmingham. It was, uh, after all, fairly spectacular, these three yes. cars. Uh, it started in Alster Road, of course, the National Westminster Bank. The car then swerved uh, down into Oxford Road, right into Grove Avenue. That's where we think, as I understand it, you think the gunman got out. Yes, that's right. And the escort then went on round the corner and uh, parked in that lock-up garage there. That's right. Uh, now, where that car stopped in Grove Road, you think the gunman might have got into another car, is that right? Or at least there was another car seen there? That's right. From witnesses that we've now interviewed, we can put uh, a metallic green 7 Series BMW as being parked in the scene with a, a lone male driver sitting in the car. Do we have any description of, of the driver in that car? Yes, we do. Uh, he's about aged about 40, uh, with a tan complexion, dark hair, a very pointed nose, uh, nearly hooked, and he'd got a very noticeable gold bracelet or watch on his left wrist. Right. It's the sort of crime that, frankly, from experience of crime, watch other villains might call in to help. Uh, if it'll tempt you, there's a £1,300 reward, £1,300. If you can help, please do call us. 01811 8055 is the number here. Or you can call Woodbridge Road Police Station in Moseley on 021 449 0043. Let me give you the number again, 021 449 0043. Well, finally tonight, the story of the man they call the cat. See if you can put a name to Britain's most successful burglar. He may well be a millionaire by now. He's burglar to the stars. He has so far broken into at least 80 homes in northwest Surrey, including those of Bruce Forsyth, Cliff Richard and members of the Kuwaiti royal family. Now, there's £50,000 in it for you if you can help. On the night of Tuesday the 10th of June, someone got into Bruce Forsyth's potting shed and made off with a ladder. Now, the ladder cost £73.60, but it was worth a fortune to the man who took it. He took it away across the grounds and then into the gardens of the house next door. Then he quietly put it up against a first floor window. It was his standard technique. The people were at home, the TV was on and the burglar alarm was off. He climbed in through the dressing room window, explored the bedroom and, under the dressing table, he found this or one exactly like it. It's a Louis Vuitton designer bag, and it was heavy, because inside it were, quite literally, the crown jewels. Now, not the British ones, but historic treasures nonetheless. They form part of the Kuwaiti royal collection. If you look over here, Cartier watches and all sorts of things. This bracelet, in fact, matches a necklace that went with it. Uh, it was made for the princess's 24th birthday and altogether this lot they're worth 20 they're worth a million pounds and more. Now most of these we have here are replicas but if you can help find the originals there's that huge reward of 50,000 pounds. So take a really good look and uh, while you're watching if you have expensive jewellery or uh, any other valuables in the house it might just be worth checking what's been happening to them while you've been tuned to Crime Watch. Well, if you can help with any of tonight's cases, please ring. The number here is 01 8055. Or if you prefer, you can write to us. The address, Crime Watch UK, BBC Television Centre, London W12 8QT. We'll give you all the local numbers again when we're back with Crime Watch Update. That's at 11.45. Now, what we've learned, I suppose, after two years on the air is that solving and preventing crime really is too important just to leave to the police. Thank you very much for calling if you did. Indeed, thank you for watching. Don't have nightmares, please. Sleep well. Good night. Good night.